The word Gothic in the popular imagination evokes images that are dark and mysterious and gloomy with creepy characters crawling around the tops of gloomy towers, towers which are adorned with menacing sculptures. And if you're in the right age group, perhaps these gargoyles were also part of your childhood memories. If any particular Gothic cathedral comes to mind, it might look something like this. If you don't recognize the movie where the screen still was taken from, I'll give you a hint. At the end of the movie in the climactic battle scene, the Dark Knight battles the Clown Prince of Crime. Yes, this was Gotham Cathedral from Tim Burton's 1989 Batman movie. Batman himself, a very gothic character, according to the pop culture associations that that word carries. And how do, can you not love how Joker becomes sort of paired, the uh, uh, mirror image of the ghouling gargoyle figure looking down in that final scene just before his death. This is, of course, an incredibly artificial view of what Gothic architecture is. And the reasons for this artificial view are twofold. First of all, by the time people became interested in Gothic cathedrals after a long period of neglect, because following the medieval period that built them, we had the Italian Renaissance, and style turned to everything Greco-Roman. It became neoclassical for the next several centuries. And by the time people took interest in them again, these cathedrals had simply gotten dirty. It had decades of industrial revolution pollutants, not to mention lichen and fungus and other grime absorbed into the porous limestone of which most European cathedrals were constructed. And the people who rediscovered these were themselves the romantics. The romantic poets and painters and aesthetes of the late 18th, early 19th century were sick to death of everything Greek and Roman as it had been for hundreds of years. It was always philosophical Greece, and the noble Romans and extolling rational man. And they were just looking for something new. They were something more emotionally fulfilling, more compelling, more something they could swoon over. And they found in the middle ages that world they were looking for. Now the world they found was a very rosy tinted King Arthur world full of knights in shining armor rescuing damsels in distress in fact, it was the romantics of this period who rediscovered that King Arthur literature and popularized it once again. It was they who uh, brought uh, to the world uh, gothic novels like Frankenstein, featuring rather medieval-esque looking creepy castles up on a hillside. And this world that they presented was also very artificial, but at least it was a, a positive view. Take a look at this image here by Caspar David Friedrich, a German romantic painter, and it nicely encapsulates the vision of history. Here we have a line of lonely monks walking in the snow into the ruins of this uh, Gothic uh, structure to reenact their rituals that are centuries and centuries old. There's something of a melancholy sort of swooning and nostalgia uh, for a kind of lost world in which life was simple but pure. It's thanks to the Romantics that we have medieval fairs today and our current fascination with medieval-esque things. And it's why I have a job. So I'm grateful to them, but neither of these images really captures what Gothic architecture was about. So let's take a look at the reality of it. Here is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, having been restored and cleaned and before the tragic fire of 2019. And as the sun sets in the West, as you can see, it glows like a giant golden monument overlooking the city. This was not constructed by a dark age looking for something gloomy and oppressive. Nobody would purposely build something like that. These were bright, fabulous monuments that reflected the most excellent levels of engineering, of piety. It was funded by the wealth of these burgeoning medieval towns. And the more you study these, the more you realize what a brilliant age it was. And this is in fact how the Notre Dame Cathedral was depicted in medieval manuscripts. This isn't fanciful or symbolic. It really was to medieval towns, these giant golden monuments that overlooked them and promised them the assurance of salvation. My name is George Brooks. I'm a medievalist and a specialist in the history of science and technology. And my special passion is the medieval technology and engineering, the craft skills of the Middle Ages, the people who left very few written records behind, but who had the manual skills and the dexterity to build 
world that set Western Europe on its course to a global preeminence. So come along with me and let me show you some of my favorite things in the world. The Gothic cathedrals of the High Middle Ages were built on a solid foundation. For two centuries before this new style emerged, Europe had come out of its early, perhaps somewhat dark period after the dissolution of the Western Roman Empire. And after several centuries of barely and grimly hanging on and then dealing with Vikings and other problems, by around the year 1000, things have settled down. The Vikings have become Christians and settled in the north of Europe. The marauders coming in from the east have been settled down in Hungary. There's no more fear of uh, Muslim incursions from Spain. And towns begin to rise, the middle class emerges, and things just start looking better on all fronts. A French monk around the year 1000 described it this way. It's as if the whole world were shaking itself free, shrugging off the burden of the past, and cladding itself everywhere in a white mantle of churches. Because when people were free to travel again, one of the things they wanted to travel and do was to see the relics and the remnants of the Christian history and the heroes of their faith that they had heard about their whole lives in their little peasant villages from behind the pulpit, they were traveling and going to these great uh, locations that had these uh, relics and remnants and leaving money. And the wiser of the church leaders used this money to rebuild their churches from the earlier wooden basilica structures that they've been following since the time of the Christian Romans and rebuilding them in stone on a magnificent scale. We call this style Romanesque. They were pilgrimage churches in the day. Romanesque is what modern art historians call them, but it's a pretty good name. They're big, they're monumental in size like the Romans would build, and they rediscovered how to build stone arches and more magnificent interiors. And that's the thing that distinctly makes them Roman looking. The basic rectangular basilica, which was modeled on old Roman public buildings, was now going to expand into very consciously cross-shaped churches. They couldn't have seen this cross floor plan, but they knew that Jesus up in heaven was looking down and probably thinking they were pretty cool. But really what this was all about was crowd control. The crowds of pilgrims coming in to see the relics needed to be maneuvered around the church through the chapels to see the individual uh, relics, leave their donations, and then file their way back out uh, so that they could then attend mass afterwards. And so Europe is going to slowly relearn the skills of monumental stone architecture. Originally, these were large stone buildings with wooden roofs, not unlike the house that you may well live in cinder block walls and wooden truss works holding up the roof, which takes advantage of the qualities of both materials. Stone is very good at resisting compression, whereas wood is very good at uh, spanning distances and due to its tensile strength, the ability to bend and flex under pressure, it doesn't crack. However, wooden roofs are also fire hazards. And so they will very soon relearn the Roman skills of spanning vast spaces with stone archwork and vaultings as we see here on the right. And so we have got about 200 years of Europeans relearning and retooling their skills, building massive stone churches everywhere in Europe. And this isn't just the large ones in the major metropolitan centers where the pilgrims are coming to see the relics. <clears throat> it's going to be built upon this, but the skills that are developed there are going to spread out to the countryside as well. Thousands of churches will be built in the period leading up to the early 12th century when the Gothic style is going to then grow out of this. And in these later churches here at Autun Cathedral, you can see how the Gothic style, see the pointy arches here and the tracery and the uh, lacy lancet windows are built right upon the earlier Romanesque interior. On the inside, we can start to see a little bit of a point in the arches that are holding up the vaulting there. And these elements are going to come together in an exciting new way very soon. These Romanesque churches also provided a setting for the reemergence of monumental sculpture, which we hadn't seen very much of in the early Middle Ages. And because this was statuary that would be seen by most viewers one time in their life when they went on pilgrimage to the great church, and because these viewers would have had on their mind the burden of their sins and the worry about salvation, the themes tended to be a bit frightening. Christ and majesty, Christ and judgment, hurling sinners into hell, the good people being saved on his right, and the bad people being carried off to a horrible end. 
All of this primed the viewers to go down under the crypt or into the chapels to see the thing that was the real draw, the physical remainders of saints and martyrs, their blood, their bones, the objects they carried, all of which they believed were imbued with some of that divine power that the saint had wielded and channeled from God during their lifetime. Here at Vezelay, you go under the crypt and you see for yourself the shin bone of Mary Magdalene, she who had known Christ directly, who had washed his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair. Who knows what shin bone that really is in there, but for the faithful, this was about as close as you could be to being in the presence of the divine itself. Equally impressive and especially charming are to go out into the countryside and see the little churches that dot the landscapes. Every little town built itself a, a new church and out of stone in the style that was emerging, which means that there was time and opportunity for hundreds, thousands of builders to develop the skills that would be necessary for what was going to come next. And that takes us to the story of the origins of Gothic architecture, which has a very particular moment in history in which it is triggered. We go now about 20 miles north of Paris to a little abbey church devoted to Saint Denis or Saint Denis in French. Every major cathedral is gonna have a statue of this guy holding his severed head in his hands. And that's Saint Denis, the patron saint of the French. His story is that he was a third century Roman Christian who decided to become a missionary and bring Christianity to the Gauls, the people who will eventually become the future French. He does his preaching and for his troubles, they cut his head off. And according to the story, Denis then bent over, picked up his head, walked all the way to Paris with his severed head, singing Christian hymns, freaking people out along the countryside and converting them in mass to Christianity. And a little bit north of where the center of Paris is today, he falls down and goes to his eternal reward. On that spot, there have been several churches and eventually a monastery that was built. And this is a very important monastery. All monasteries have some secular patron uh, that supports them. And this one is supported by the King of France himself. So the monks of Saint-Denis are not just monks that do a lot of praying and uh, chanting. These monks are basically the king's secretarial pool. They are his collection of literate people that he can send off to do uh, ambassador work, to be secretaries, to write up charters. Uh, they basically do the paperwork that runs the kingdom of France. In the 12th century, the abbot of Saint-Denis and here's the church that he will soon have built, was named Suger. Abbot Suger had been an oblate to the monastery. An oblate is a child given to the monks to be raised, and it's how the monks, who have no children of their own to take their place in their profession, it's how they replenish their ranks. So Suger has, since childhood, grown up in a monastery. And Suger eventually becomes its abbot and an extremely powerful man. In fact, when the King of France, Louis VI, went off on the Second Crusade, he left Suger in charge of the country. He ran things while the king was gone on his giant failure of a crusade. Why would you leave a monk in charge of France? Well, if you leave some duke or baron in charge of France, he may well make himself king by the time you return. But a monk is really not able to uh, rise above his monastic station, so he's someone safe that you can trust with responsibilities. In any case, Suger becomes a great patron of the arts. And Suger loves shiny things. He writes a big book of his administration, and he tells us goldsmiths and jewel setters, and silversmiths that uh, make the art that are embellishing uh, his church in the kingdom of France. On the right is the chalice that he had made that he uses to conduct mass. He was also an ordained priest. Now, Suger is not a greedy man. He has no need for money. He's never had to worry about a paycheck in his life. Uh, Suger is well taken care of. For him, gold and silver and jewels reflect God's magnificence, and they are a worthy way of ornamenting uh, the church that honors God here on earth. One day, Suger is in the monastic library reading old documents, and he comes upon this old writing which describes someone having this beatific vision in which the angels carry him up the ladder of light, and he sees God's church in heaven. 
And God's church is not made out of wood and stone and brick. God's church is made in heaven out of gold and silver and jewels and emeralds and rubies. It's this giant light-filled kaleidoscope of amazing, mesmerizing, mystical light. Perhaps looking a little something like this. And Sujay decides, I need to rebuild this church anyway. I've got pilgrims coming to see the relics. And it's completely appropriate to rebuild the church according to this vision because the name at the end of the document was Dionysius. And that is the Latin version of the name Denny or Dennis. So Sujay believed that he was reading a vision of God's mystical church in heaven written by the patron saint whose bones were down in the crypt of his monastery. Now, Sujay is in fact completely confused. We now know uh, that he's reading a fifth century document by some unknown anonymous hermit who may well have been tripping on rotten rye bread and having her godamine induced hallucinations. Who knows? But he writes up this vision, and the name that he puts on it is actually meant to be Dionysius the Areopagite, a character in the New Testament that St. Paul debates with. And so Suji has both of these people confused with this third century patron saint. Peter Abelard spent some time at uh, Saint Denis, and when he was there, he analyzed this document and explained to them with his newly developed skills at linguistics that they were completely confused. These monks, of course, were not at all happy to hear that, and they sent him on his way. In any case, we're glad that Suje was confused because he is going to end up triggering something magnificent in the history of architecture. And it's going to be made possible by something called stained glass. After the year 1000, developments were happening in the making of glass. Now, all glass back then was blown glass that you then spun and it uh, fanned outwards. And they discovered that if you add mineral oxides to it, you can get different colors. Sulfuric oxide, iron oxide, copper oxides, precious metals uh, ground into powder and added to it. And you can make a variety of colors. So this isn't painted glass. This is actually colored glass with just little painted details highlighting things like uh, the hands and the eyes. So here, what you're looking at is one of the earliest pieces of surviving French stained glass. It's in a little museum uh, in Paris today. And uh, this early development is going to quickly evolve and become magnificent, uh, huge panels of glass depicting Bible stories that formerly had been painted into manuscript books or depicted on the walls of churches. And now they're going to be done in glass where sunlight will illuminate them from behind, which for them is also kind of mystical light comes down from God. And so it's like God himself who is illuminating the stories of the Bible for the believers to be surrounded by. Now, we're going to need a framework to hold these massive glass windows. And that's where the tricky part comes in. Sujay, being as powerful as he is, is able to command the greatest masons and carpenters and builders uh, to his monastery to describe his vision. And he's going to want a building with giant windows that are going to be dozens of feet wide and surround the worshipers with glimmering glass. Now, we don't know who these builders were he was speaking to. Sujay tells us all about his goldsmiths and his jewel cutters. He doesn't tell us about the builders who built his church. But whoever they were, they must have first said, this is impossible. If you have windows this big, the wall will crash through. You need walls to support a roof. But Sujay was insistent, he wanted it built, so they figured out a way to do it. And what they did was take elements that had been in use before, like pointed arches, which, because they're more vertical, take the thrust of gravity more directly to the ground and have a little less lateral In ribbed vaulting, as you see here, rather than just having uh, roofs holding up a vaulted wall, we have reinforced ribbing that carries the bulk of the weight of the roof down to the pillars and then directs them to the floor. So the result of pointed arches and ribbed vaulting is that rather than building up walls holding up a roof, you build a stone skeletal structure and you very carefully control the thrust of gravity and direct it where you want it so you don't have to have walls everywhere holding everything up. And the result as we see here in the uh, East Choir, or the Chevet of Saint-Denis, is a large, spacious, airy uh, area in which you just kind of feel like a bird. You want to just kind of fly around. 
you have to be in these places to fully appreciate them. And it makes you realize how much of your life you spend in closed little boxes and the, the buildings, the rooms uh, in which we live our lives. And suddenly you're in this vast open space and it is quite uh, ennobling. It is quite an uplifting space. And then because the same uh, network of arches and ribs and columns are holding the weight of the roof, there is larger area to put in wider and taller windows all around the outside so that you have a flooded, light-filled church. When they finally build the rest of it, we end up with the most luminescent, colorful medieval structure or any structure that had ever been built. This goes beyond what even the Romans had achieved with their vaunted architectural skills. Gothic architecture is more spacious, holds more space, and is more sophisticated in its architectural engineering than anything that came before it. Now, there's one final element that has to be added, because as you build bigger and bigger, there is still lateral stress. A stress You're going to be pushing on the outside of the walls, and so buttressing is required. And the problem, though, is that if you put holes holding up your uh, pillars here, well, then you're going to have the sun cast shadows from these buttress walls onto your windows, and that's going to undermine the whole purpose of building all of this in the first place, which is to get light into your church. And that's where flying buttresses come in. The distinctive external element of Gothic architecture are these big, arched out, reaching kind of stone arms, it looks like crab legs or spider legs that reach out from the building and further dilute the force of gravity into smaller rivulets and carry it to the ground. So all these windows are held up by buttresses, which are actually at a distance from the building, connected through these flyers, which then divert uh, the thrust to it and take it to the ground. And the result is astounding. On the left is one of the finest and most light-filled and graceful of all Romanesque churches that have been built in the period before Gothic. And it's a lovely building. But you compare that to what you can achieve using the Gothic system, and there's just no comparison. It's a whole other species of architecture. The amount of light and color that you can fill your building with is simply unmatched uh, until you take on this new approach. Nothing done in the Romanesque can match what you're going to be able to do with Gothic. And so to recap, the three elements that make a Gothic cathedral stand up are the pointed arch, as we see here, directing gravity more vertically to the ground, ribbed vaults, as we see here, carrying the thrust and directing it to the pillars that are going to hold it up, and then ultimately flying buttresses, which continue that process of carrying the thrust out and away from the building, directed to the ground, but leaving room for sunlight no matter where the sun is in the sky, to interpenetrate these buttresses and get to the windows and accomplish what's, uh, what the whole goal was in the first place. And that is a church that surrounds the worshipers with colored glass, with mystical glimmering light, depicting all the stories of the Bible, of Christian history, the saints, the martyrs, Christ, Mary, all the way down to the, all the local saints and folklore, like St. Eustace here, a local uh, hunter who became a saint after seeing a vision of a cross in a deer's antlers. And if this image looks vaguely familiar to you, next time you look at a Jägermeister bottle, you'll see that same image. Jägermeister means master hunter. It is a reference to this story. That colored glass can also throw its light onto the stone in the interior of the church creating, in some cases, a slow-moving kaleidoscope of color. Some glass windows do it better than others, and medieval glass is unique. Different places had slightly different formulas for the colors that they were making, and so you can't always be sure of the effect uh, that it's going to have. The final result was called by a famous art historian decades ago, a Bible in glass and stone. The increasingly uh, sophisticated skills of the sculptors who are embracing a naturalistic approach as opposed to the early very stylized geometric approach of the Romanesque in the early Middle Ages. We now have sculptors that are obviously walking about in nature, looking at plants, looking at the human form, and learning to depict them uh, with great naturalism 
uh, and the glassmakers are becoming increasingly sophisticated in their manner of putting uh, intricate and detailed stories in window form, a Bible in glass and stone. Sujay had himself depicted a couple of times in his own stained glass windows. There he is at the bottom at the feet of the Virgin Mary in an Ave Maria scene. And it's very interesting how he's depicted here, a very thoughtful way of doing it. Notice how he breaks the frame of the circular medallion uh, that frames the picture. His feet are outside with us down in this world, but his head is up there in the mystical realm at the feet of the Virgin Mary. And this was very much on purpose. Writing about the effect of his church, we have a rare example of a thoughtful medieval writer describing the effects of art, the effects of aesthetics on a person. And he writes these words. Thus went out of my delight in the beauty of the house of God, the loveliness of the many colored gems has called me away from external cares and worthy meditation has induced me to reflect, transferring that which is material to that which is immaterial on the diversity of the sacred virtues. To me that I see myself dwelling, as it were, in some strange region of the universe, which neither exists entirely in the slime of the earth, nor entirely in the purity of heaven, and that by the grace of God, I can be transported from this inferior to that higher world in anagogical manner. Abbot Sujay of Saint-Denis. So this was the effect that he wanted and that he finally got in his church, glass windows now showing the very same images and the same stylistic traditions that we'd seen in manuscript paintings and earlier carvings and metalwork. Here we have Christ surrounded by symbols of the four gospel writers. All now framed within the architecture of the church that creates a, an experience that is mystical and sublime. And truly, there's nothing that can prepare you for your first time being in one of these amazing buildings. I'd studied Gothic architecture for years before I finally went to Europe. And when I was in these places, in Notre Dame in Paris and Chartres Cathedral, I, I literally wept. I was in tears. It was so beautiful. You must go and see these things before you leave this world. Giant curtain walls of glass, looking as if the glass windows are holding up the ceiling. It's an amazing illusion. So this is Gothic architecture, a very poorly named thing, incidentally. They did not call it Gothic in their own day. Gothic was a term that was applied to it by Renaissance scholars who sneered at everything medieval in their preference for all things Greek and Roman. And they called it Gothic as an insult. They meant it in the same way that they meant Gothic darkness and Gothic ignorance, referring to the Goth barbarians who, in their view, had come down and destroyed the glorious Roman Empire at the end of the ancient world. We're kind of stuck with this term today, but I think it's high time we rethought what Gothic really means. In the Middle Ages, this was known as the Opus Francogenum, or the French style. It was born just north of Paris. It will soon spread across France and eventually go international. French style churches. Many of these churches uh, began as pilgrimage destinations. It's a lot of the time what supplied them money uh, to rebuild in this grand Gothic style. And so some other interesting elements that you'll find in these churches include labyrinths on the floor. Here's the one in Chartres Cathedral. And there's a better aerial view of it taken by drone. Now, a labyrinth is the final point of the pilgrim's journey. These pilgrims have been traveling for months and months from whatever village they came from, thinking about their sins, thinking about their lives, worrying about salvation. And when you finally get to the church, the last thing you do is you walk the labyrinth. A labyrinth is not a maze. You don't get lost in a labyrinth. You simply follow through and endure through all of its winding paths. And all of it is a metaphor for how we wind our way through life, through many trials and tribulations, until we get to the center where we find Christ in peace. And then from that center point, they would go forward uh, to the altar, take communion, have mass, and complete their pilgrim's journey. Labyrinth walking has uh, become popular again today by new age types who uh, have portable rollout labyrinths. And uh, there are many uh, places that will build labyrinths. I've seen them in uh, hospitals and in uh, cemeteries. 
and labyrinth walking in the great cathedrals is still uh, an attraction for those seeking a mystical experience. Even more complex ones can be found at places here like Amiens Cathedral. And here are uh, many of them uh, that have survived. Many of them are, are destroyed in the centuries following the Middle Ages. Sometimes churches went through renovations. They tried to make them look more classical and they took out some of the medieval elements. So uh, regrettably, uh, some of these are now missing, but we do have drawings of them that were made by uh, people that valued them and knew that records of them would want to be kept. So here's a nice collection of Gothic labyrinths for you. Medieval people that grew up around these Gothic cathedrals being built in towns that are now expanding in their population and have people that are gonna see these every day, uh, use these as learning devices. Basically everything they knew about the world and that was a Christian world that they knew about is depicted here. Any medieval person growing up hearing sermons behind the pulpit would have been able to identify the guy with the key in his hand. That's always St. Peter to whom Christ gave the keys to bind and to loose. And upon uh, this rock, uh, he will build his church. See the church underneath. The guy over here, the little uh, baptismal bowl with a lamb in it, that's always John the Baptist. And medieval people could read the visual images and uh, read the pictures as easily as you can you know, read Superman's insignia uh, today. These, these well-known uh, symbolism, well-known identifying language, a visual language that even illiterate peasants were able to read. And everything else about the world as well. You might recognize the medieval version of the signs of the zodiac, uh, parts of them going up this wall and they continue uh, down uh, the sides of other doors. And of course, there's always the danger that uh, demons are looking, lurking everywhere, uh, wanting to lure you in with sin and temptation. It's the church that keeps them in line. These little demons here looking rather distressed as these saints uh, keep them in check. But if you are not careful, they can come out and get you. Luckily, you have the church there reminding you that they're there to keep you safe. Not everything that the church taught was necessarily benevolent. As lovely as this uh, church door and portal is, there's actually a kind of a, a grim uh, message being taught there. You probably don't recognize the screaming anti-Semitism that you were looking at here, but medieval people would have understood it. There's nothing here about the uh, jam statuary. It has to do with the uh, full-length statues on either side. Let me enlarge them for you. Here's one of the uh, rather dour sides of medieval church instruction. Here we have allegorical images of ecclesia and synagogia, meaning the allegorical representation of the Christian church and the Jewish religion. On the left, ecclesia, the Christian church, standing proud, crowned, authoritative, her staff of authority intact, she has the blood of Christ, the wisdom of God, and she's wealthy. Notice the money bag right here. As opposed to the Jewish religion, blind to the coming of their Messiah, ignoring their own uh, prophets, not following their own teachings, their staff of authority broken, their crown tumbled, no homeland. People don't just grow up hating folks. You have to be taught to hate somebody. And anti-Semitism, unfortunately, has very deep roots in the medieval world uh, and sadly still uh, exists today. This is how medieval people uh, learn to identify others in order for them to hate. Well, let's uh, raise the mood a little bit here. Another interesting detail that we cannot leave out are these uh, creatures carved in the tops of cathedrals. Does anybody know what these are called? Let me hear you say it. Gargoyles? No, 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 my friend. These are not gargoyles. Gargoyles have a very specific function in church architecture. Here's an actual gargoyle from above that allows you to see its function. Gargoyles are water spouts. All of these cathedrals built in the north of Europe have to deal with the fact that it rains a lot in the north of Europe. And rainwater is mildly acidic. You can't let it sit on your roof. It'll slowly eat away into your limestone. So we've got to drain it off the roof, just like your house has a gutter system uh, as well. And you don't want it just running down the sides of your building because it'll stain the building. You need to throw it away from the building to keep your uh, cathedral nice and clean. And so that is what a gargoyle does. On the left, what you have are simply decorative statues looking uh, charming and ghoulish. These are usually called grotesques or sometimes chimera. So it's a grotesque if it's simply there for a decorative element. If it serves the function of draining water, it is a gargoyle. 
The word gargoyle is a French onomatopoeia. If you don't remember that word from English class, an onomatopoeia is a word that comes from the sound like kaboom or bow wow. And because it rains a lot in the north, these uh, drain pipes are very often slowly gurgling water down the side. So they are literally gurglers. It's the same root word as to gargle with mouthwash in the morning. So if you're wondering, is it a gargoyle or a grotesque? You simply must ask yourself, is it spitting out rainwater? And here's the one thing you'll never forget about Gothic cathedrals. If it doesn't gurgle, it's not a gargoyle. Let me take a moment to show you one of my favorite gargoyles. This fellow here is on Strasbourg Cathedral in the far east of France near the German border. I remind you of a certain character from uh, Lord of the Rings. I think they left all the green uh, moss growing on him on purpose because it makes him stand out from the pinkish background so nicely. And as we look at these amazing cathedrals and are awed by their beauty, we have to also pay respect to the medieval technology that made this possible. It was all about medieval engineering. A lot of people today are still surprised that medieval technology is a thing. It seems like an anachronism, a, a juxtaposition of, of words here. Um, but in fact, the Middle Ages was a very rich and vibrant technological era. They'd inherited the water mills left behind by the ancient Romans to far more complex machines that did a dozen different industrial processes and really set the stage for the industrial revolution of the Western world. Most people think of the Industrial Revolution as a 19th century uh, event, but in fact, the idea that you can build a machine to replicate human labor and get work done more quickly by harnessing natural forces and bring more forces to bear than human muscle alone or animal muscle can bring, this was a medieval windmills, water mills, had revolutionized industry and dotted the countryside uh, during the high Middle Ages. It's very hard to really get into uh, the minds of the people that were doing this amazing building and inventing because these folks were not in the habit of leaving written records. Writing exists, of course, but writing was what churchmen did and elite types did. People that built things learned on a construction site. They were apprenticed to a mason or a carpenter and they uh, learned by doing. And this was passed down from uh, master uh, to pupil uh, for many, many centuries. So to reconstruct how these things were done, to relearn the methods of building and uh, craft that medieval people employed, we have to go and use a variety of evidence, often in roundabout ways. So the margins of manuscripts are very instructive, uh, trying to simply replicate uh, their skills through experimental archeology span is a uh, rather fun method of doing this also trying to get at the designers of these cathedrals, the so-called architects, is extremely difficult. The word architect in the Middle Ages could just as easily have referred to the patron who was paying for the church as it did to the person that understood how to design and build it. Uh, it was probably teams of master masons that came in and actually figured these things out before they even achieved the title of architect. By the later Middle Ages, more of them are known, and as their fame rises with the uh, amazing magnificence of their constructions, they even uh, dare to have themselves depicted in their cathedrals. You're looking at Peter Parler uh, from the Parler family of uh, architects and masons who worked on Prague Cathedral. And of all of them, the only one of these builders who did leave us something like a book behind mostly images that describes the kind of work he did was someone named Villa de Anacur. He's the only Gothic builder to leave behind a manuscript of building techniques and uh, artistic uh, references. We know nothing about Villar other than what we can learn from his book. He does not appear in any document, any charter, his name is not inscribed in any cathedral, and there has been a debate running for well over a century over what exactly this guy really did and why he made his collection of drawings. It wasn't at first a book he was trying to make. He simply had loose parchment leaves and he made drawings as he traveled and apparently uh, worked on various cathedrals. And it seems that only late in his life did he decide to put all of this together and try to make a book, an instructional manual out of it. 
And in it, he greets his audience and asks those who will make use of his uh, book to pray for a soul and remember him, and that they would find in here useful instruction in masonry and the engines of carpentry, in uh, art and portraiture as geometry instructs. And so we have to take these few little clues from the inscriptions, most of which were added much, much later at the end to his collection of drawings to try to figure out who this person was. Whoever he was, he leaves us a tantalizing and invaluable glimpse into the minds of people who worked in the environs of Gothic architecture. His portfolio of drawings shows us flying buttresses and roof trusses and engines of carpentry the uh, machines that master builders would have had to know how to make. Up here, we have a double action hydraulic saw. Of the water is turning this wheel, which turns this axle, and the spikes here move a log along into a saw blade, which is then pushed down by uh, these uh, cams, and then is returned by the spring, and is supplied by this sapling tree here. It takes a few minutes looking at this to reconstruct how this would have looked or how this would have worked. We also have here uh, crossbow traps for hunting, a screw jack, which lifts heavy loads, an interesting attempt at a clockwork mechanism, which could not have possibly worked. Vilar was active about 70 years or so before mechanical clocks were finally invented in Western Europe. And even little devices uh, like this mechanical bird that could be uh, moved around by a preacher as he's reading the uh, gospels uh, to uh, the parishioners. He could have uh, pulled the hidden lever and made the bird look like he was also scanning the book along with the preacher. You got to keep kids awake in church somehow. Whatever else he did, Villar was certainly a trained artist. He draws with a very confident hand. He has a distinctive style. So he's definitely an artist of some sort. What, he, what medium he worked in cannot quite be known to us. He could have carved in wood, cast in metal, carved in stone, maybe painted, although it doesn't really talk about painting and drawing uh, in his manuscript. So here we see, again, that Gothic naturalism, very lively and realistic images of bears and swans, leafy-headed green men. And here is something about that portraiture is instructed by geometry that he had been talking about. And he doesn't give us very much detail. Anybody learning this would have learned from a master uh, on site. He would have been apprenticed and had somebody skilled there, but he thought that his book might have been helpful uh, in guiding them in their learning. Notice how a triangle can be the basis for a horse or a human head. And a pentacle star can be uh, the uh, crown of a building or a human face. Up here, we have the face divided into three equal quadrants. If you take your thumb and your forefinger and uh, measure out from your hairline to between your eyes, you can then move that proportion down from between your eyes to beneath your nose, above your lip, and then move that down from above your lip to your chin. And most people have faces that are divided roughly into three even. Go ahead and check it for yourself. This is also described in the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius in his book on architecture. Vitruvius wrote around the days of Julius Caesar. And at the dawn of the empire, Vitruvius had been, again, one of these rare builders who aspired to the pen and uh, left us a very extensive written work of what engineers and builders were able to do back in Roman times. It is unlikely that Vilar, 13 centuries later, was actually reading Vitruvius. It is more likely that these same skills and geometrical tricks and proportions have been passed down for thousands of years from the time of the earliest Egyptian and Greek builders uh, to the Roman successors down through the Middle Ages in an unbroken tradition. And it's just on occasion that we'll have one of these builders uh, give us an imprint of this in some written form. Incidentally, the same page that we find this division of the face in threes, uh, just afterwards, we find Vitruvius's description of how the human form, whether it's standing upright or with uh, arms and legs spread, fits inside a square in a circle an image famously drawn by Leonardo da Vinci that you probably have seen. Given the amount of architectural plans, elevations, and technical skills that are rendered, Villar was most likely some sort of carpenter engineer. He may have known masonry as well, but he was definitely a multi-skilled engineering person. At the time, they would have called someone like this an ingeniator. 
Uh, it is the root of the word ingenious as well as the word engineer. And this was an emerging class of skilled craftsmen and mechanics uh, and engine builders that knew how to do a variety of uh, engineering things. They were the ones who build catapults for the and can also redesign the king's uh, kitchen if he uh, decides to. Uh, so we see this uh, term in various uh, documents referring to the king's ingeniator. Uh, and so Villar seems to have been among uh, that class of uh, skilled craftsmen. And his work seems to have been involved with church patronage as almost everything in his collection of drawings has to do with churches that were under construction or some elements of how churches are furnished or uh, embellished. And it may well be that he uh, made some of his drawings on a gathering mission to get ideas uh, for uh, the church back home uh, that had sent him out uh, for this. In any case, we don't know for sure who Villar was, but Villar is, in fact, a very excellent guide to Gothic architecture. He worked with some of the greatest cathedrals that were being built in the 13th century. He leaves us drawings and renderings of various details of them. And so as we travel around Europe and look at some of the great monuments of Gothic architecture, Villard will accompany us and uh, provide occasional drawings and uh, give us a contemporary vision of what was happening in the great age of Gothic cathedrals. <laughs>